Joining us now, I'm so happy she's with us, Sarah Palin, an old friend of the program, former governor of the great state of Alaska, vice presidential candidate, of course, and her new book, Sweet Freedom, a devotional. And I've, I just started opening up the book, reading through the book. There's, all, I've already found like three Bible passages that are completely relevant to the conversation today. When you're persecuted, you're under attack, where do you go? How do you lean on that rock of your faith? Uh, so much in here in this book. We'll get into the book and also want to get her take on uh, current events. And Governor Palin joins us now. Governor Palin, how are you? Great to talk to you. Congrats on the book. Hey, thanks so much. It's always great to talk to you. And yeah, you articulated well what that book is all about. How, you know, Old and New Testament, it is amazing how the parables and verses and the inspirations that we get out of it, how they are so applicable to all of the specific problems we're facing today. And people are very um, concerned. You should see my board of callers right now, Governor Palin. People, people almost don't recognize their country today. They don't. They don't feel like this. This the, the country and the country's re- representatives, leaders, are for the people. They're for maybe a global understanding or a global community or global approval. But what's good for the people? Um, often gets the back seat, and they're and they're afraid. They're not just afraid of like ISIS; they're actually afraid of their own government. Well, yeah, and that's why people are tuning into you too, Laura, because they're getting answers from you. And and that, it, I mean, the way that you explain things, it, it's such a manifestation of your own faith too, and how you stand on that rock, and and you understand that the time tested truths that have been spelled out for us in the perfect uh, blueprint uh, for finding answers, and and that's in Scripture. How you're able to explain things, that's giving people hope, and that's what we need, because I get the same thing. People all over the country, all over the world, they too, they'll contact me saying, man, things are just out of control. It's beyond tumultuous times. We're beyond worried. We're losing hope. Where do we go to find the answers? And there's no way within our own political power or system or reliance on the next great politician. There is no way that we're going to be able to save this country. We have to be on our knees doing what our founders did, and that's rededicating this land, our wonderful abundant natural resources, our work ethic, the work for We have to rededicate it to God, and we better quit taking for granted all the things that he provided us, because that's the sense I get is that too many in authority, we do, they do just take it for granted and expect that, oh, someone else is going to, you know, join the military and defend it for us. And somebody else is going to, um, you know, figure out a way to teach the next generation uh, what uh, priorities really should be. But the way we're going, relying on that, mm-hmm. it's so fallible that it's putting on that path towards destruction. When you when you listen to the president yesterday, we'll play another clip for you just to torture you, Governor Palin. Um, I want I want you to listen to the way he referred to uh, Christians and Christianity. Let's listen. When candidates say we want to admit three year old orphans, that's political posturing. When individuals say that we should have a religious test and that only Christians, proven Christians, should be admitted, that's offensive. Um, some of my listeners picked up on just the way he referenced Christianity, much like he referenced the Crusades some months back. Uh, it, you just don't get the sense that it's our security that's really uh, motivating him. It, it was it was such derision that he referred to the governor standing against the the vetting of these supposed vetting of these refugees. Well, right, and it, now we're we're expected to hold those in authority accountable. We're expected to pray for those uh, in authority. You know, we're told that in the Bible, but we're also told that we have a right, we have a responsibility to keep their feet held to the fire when they deceive the public. And that's those sound bites you just played. This man is so full of deception, Laura. Who has ever, have, have any of those candidates on stage said, I don't want three-year-old orphans in my country. Have you ever said that, Laura? No. no you adopted those orphans, bless your heart. <laughs> Have you ever heard a, a Christian or a conservative say, we don't want, we don't want to help any refugees and, uh, you know, all these specifics he's saying? No, he, it's outright lies that our own president is spewing to the American public, but he's also underestimating the wisdom of the people because I believe, Laura, we ain't buying it. There are more and more people, Democrats, whose eyes are opening, saying 
things are getting out of control when we have the leader of the free world who would so blatantly lie to us with this propaganda, this Orwellian speak that he spewed just then in those sound bites, and people are saying, well, we're not really sure what to do about it, but we know that something is so wrong. Um, there is a part in your book, and, there, and, and for people who um, like, you know, like inspiration in short form because you're busy, this is a good book for that because you can go day by day with the spiritual um, refreshment that we all need, and we can we can put it on the back burner. I've done that too, Governor Palin. Where oh, I'm too busy. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna read this later because you get caught up in the daily grind, frankly, and the and the pace of life is so fast. It's nice to spend a few moments every day reflecting on what's most important and that mean for for christians obviously scripture is most important because it contains everything we need so there was a there was a uh, uh there's a passage from isaiah uh chapter 5 um verse 20 and in you say look the second amendment deters evil this is the, the heading you give to this and you say woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And that pretty much sums up the you know, the game that's played by the establishment. They call they call people who want to enforce the borders horrible, rotten people. They're, when in fact it's it's really horrible to make your country vulnerable. That's what's horrible. But they, they spin it and scripture identifies what's going on. It's rever- it's reverting good to evil and hoping that nobody notices. But you know, we, we can notice if we actually pay attention. Yeah, and a lot of people, uh, we need to ask God to open our eyes and our hearts and our ears to understand what's actually going on. And, and, and then we can identify the problem and then do something about the problem. But Scripture came, obviously, uh, way before uh, George Orwell's 1984. And I refer so often to the Orwellian speak, the double speak, that uh, Obama and his ilk would spew to confuse the American public, and it's so purposeful. But, and I, I use that, the terminology there that's Orwellian, just assuming that, ah, doggone it, this younger generation especially, they've been, in some respects, so absent from those truths that we learn in, in Scripture, but maybe they were forced to read 1984, mm. so maybe they can understand some aspects in the secular of, of what we're talking about. But I'm to the point now of saying, you know, we we have no choice, really. We have to get back to those Judeo-Christian beliefs of our founders. We have to start teaching the younger generation about them. We can't assume any more than in a public school they are forced to read 1984 like we all were. Um, so it's our responsibility, I think, Laura, to get out there and, and speak the truth despite, despite the political incorrectness of it all, because our... Our kids, that next generation, they're getting brainwashed, obviously, from, well, the, concern, uh, from the, the leaders of the right, world. The concern that uh, the elites have right now is that there is going to be a backlash in the United States against Muslims. And there have been pieces written about this, commentators on television, uh, political leaders in France talking about, oh, we have to worry about the backlash. And we don't want, we don't, I mean, no one wants a backlash against innocent people of any, of any background or religion or, or, or skin color. That, that, of course, that's not what anyone is for. But meanwhile, we see a current brutalization uh, ongoing of the Christian people who, and this is their homeland in the Middle East. They sp- speak the language of Christ, Aramaic, many of them, and they've been brutalized, killed, forced to convert to Islam. And yet we've heard almost nothing about their plight in any really meaningful way from this president. I mean, there hasn't been one speech that he's given that I've noted that really spelled out what's on the line here. And well, right. not where, at all. Where is he, even on the uh, the Christian, hopefully not to be martyrs, but they're getting in line to be martyrs, the Christians who are enslaved right now right. in some right. of the foreign lands that we have, we have the authority to get in there and, and sanction or even through military might, whatever it takes in order to go protect a Christian in an, another land if we so chose, but the president doesn't choose that. And the reason, of course, that many in our culture assume, they just assume that what the president is, is speaking is truth when he talks about conservatives or people of faith being um, discriminatory against refugees and that we're intolerant. They've been building up 
do this for so long now, calling us racist, calling us intolerant, calling us a discriminatory based on gender or anything else, all that division that um, the, the liberals have created in this country. Unfortunately, too many people have allowed the label that's been slapped across our forehead that we're racist or that, you know, we're intolerant. Right. We haven't peeled that label off aggressively enough, and now we're in this boat of, of too many people assuming that oh, it must be true. Who do you like in the presidential contest, if anybody? I like all the non-politicians, and there's a few of them in there. Um, I don't like anybody who's been a part of the problem all these years, um, you know, voting for the increased budgets, voting to increase the debt ceiling, and now all of a sudden saying, uh, I'm not for that, and once I get in there, well, I'm going to change it. It's like, well, y- you are part of the problem. You know, sounds don't, like you're talking about Marco Rubio. Now. It sounds like you're talking about well, Rubio there. Well, I like Ted Cruz. I think he, he at least has tried taking action, you know, through filibuster, through really making um, some strong um, moves to, to just, fulfill his campaign promises you know that's about all we're asking for in our elected officials is you campaign one way you better not govern another way so i respect cruz for that of course i like trump and i like carson because they're not politicians and they're not sure doesn't seem like they're Mm -hmm. bought and paid for by uh, you know crony capitalists or anything so i appreciate them but just very happy laura probably like you that we have a competitive primary as opposed to the the skids being greased for Hillary on the other side. <laughs> the anointing of the usual establishment candidate who proceeds to go on to October of the election year and lose. Yes, we don't want. We definitely don't want that. Uh, so- that and and Laura, we're we're the party of diversity now. Look at the different backgrounds. Look, look at the different experiences that we have up there on that stage on the GOP, as opposed to the grumpy old white guys and gals on the other side. Oh, I love it. Sweet freedom, a devotional. Sarah Palin's new book is on our Facebook page. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful way to kind of uh, decompress from a crazy day. And, and when you th- when you think the Bible doesn't contain words of wisdom about a particular problem in your life, you'll find out when you read this book. Oh yes, it does. And the Bible uh, verse is actually presented to you at the t- at the beginning of each section. Um, and remember, even as specific as. Um Second Amendment rights. Jesus talks about it. Luke 22nd. I keep telling people, look it up, and you're going to be a proponent of our Second Amendment after reading it. I like the fact that a bad hair day is in the Bible, too. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go to all the really stupid points, but that you, you don't make it, it, That's just a fun title. Uh, we're delighted you were with us. Sarah Palin, thank you so much. Best of luck out there. Please and keep in touch with us. Sweet freedom. A devotional. Don't go away. The-